Hello, and thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast video page. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm talking to the leading voices in Bitcoin about their backstories and their philosophy on BTC. This is a very special episode where I get to bring back one of my absolute favorite guests, the Bitcoin Standard author, Saifedean Amus, who just released his incredible new book, The Fiat Standard. This episode was brought to you by the Bitcoin Conference. It's going to be held in Miami next year, April 6th through 9th, and it's going to be the biggest Bitcoin conference yet. You can get 10% off your tickets using the code COINSTORIES and the link b.tc slash conference. I'm super excited to share this episode is also brought to you by OKCoin, one of my favorite new places to buy Bitcoin. OKCoin is the fastest growing exchange serving over 190 countries globally with the easiest onboarding and lowest fees around. They're on a mission to make learning about and buying Bitcoin easier than ever. And they're all about bringing more financial literacy to everyone, which is something I really care about as well. From being the only exchange to integrate Lightning to contributing over a million dollars to Bitcoin core devs, they are doing incredible work to further the Bitcoin ecosystem. OKCoin is also committed to boosting women in this space. They offer scholarships to women for education. And if you head to go.okcoin.com slash Natalie, you can get $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. So without further ado, here's my guest, Saifedina Moose. We're going to be talking about this amazing sequel, The Fiat Standard, which is all about how government money affects everything from our food to our health to our everyday lives. Here's Saifedean. All right, Safe, I'm so excited to have you back. First of all, congratulations on getting ready to publish the Fiat Standard. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me back. So I want to chat about this book because you know I've like sung your praises to everybody. Uh, I love the Bitcoin Standard. I've read it now three times. I listened to it once on, on Audible. I'm just obsessed with it. I think everyone should read it and it should be required reading. And the Fiat Standard was just as good. It's an amazing sequel. So why did you feel like you wanted to write this second book? Um, well, uh, first of all, there was quite a bit of uh, unanswered questions in the Bitcoin Standard. I mean, um, like the main idea of the Bitcoin standard is that Bitcoin is better money, Bitcoin, and better money wins. Um, but there wasn't much of a discussion of, uh, well, how is it going to win and how can it interact with the fiat uh, monetary system? So there was that as a kind of motivation, which was, um, we, which is what I was kind of writing about in the first few months after uh, I published the Bitcoin standard. Um, I was writing for subscribers at some point um, a bunch of articles about you know how can Bitcoin rise and different scenarios for Bitcoin's rise and so on. And um, then I figured you know the main thing that I needed in order to answer this question is I needed to look at fiat itself with a lot of detail, with a similar kind of analytical. Um, analytical approach that I took with the Bitcoin standard. I need to look more closely at how fiat actually works in order to be able to figure out how Bitcoin works. And so I started, um, it was, I think, it was really uh, Giacomo Zucco who was giving a talk in um, in uh, Riga in uh, the Baltic Honey Badger Conference in, um, I think it was in September 2019. Yeah, it was in September 2019, maybe 2018. No, 2019, September 2019. So I'd already written a bunch of stuff about how Bitcoin is going to be rising and um, I was planning on putting it into a book. And then what really clicked it for me was watching that presentation from Giacomo in which he was, the, the title of the presentation was Steel Manning Altcoin Apologia or Steel Manning Altcoins or something like that. Trying to make the best case for altcoins possible. And, um, you know, Giacomo is one of the least... Uh, likely people to defend altcoins but he sat down and made what he found to be the strongest case for altcoins which i thought was fascinating um, but i also liked the idea of um, looking trying to look at these um, inferior monetary systems and try and figure out how they work and so i then got the idea that yeah i should combine all of the previous stuff that i was doing into a book um, but the basis of the book should be studying fiat. And so the idea occurred to me, yep, it needs to be titled The Fiat Standard. And so um, I think it was the first time that I mentioned this was in uh, Milano in, uh, I think it was in January. Yeah, I think it was in January uh, 2020. So I, w I went to Milano. Also, I was invited by Giacomo as well. 
And I had I had, I was supposed to go to Milano in 2018 to give a talk about the Bitcoin standard, but then uh, things happened and I had to cancel on the same day. I couldn't fly uh, to Milano on that day, and then I didn't end up going. And then we rescheduled it, and I went in January 2020. And I was supposed to be talking about the Bitcoin standard there, but um, I scammed them by uh, giving them the fiat standard instead of the Bitcoin standard. So I put up a slide saying, you know, I want to talk about the Bitcoin standard. I was going to talk about the Bitcoin standard, but I'm not. In fact, I'm going to talk about the fiat standard, which is going to be my next book. And um, that was the beginning of the uh, approach. So I gave a bunch of presentations about it and spent a lot of time reading and writing about it. And then uh, COVID came along, so I had a ton of time to uh, think and read and write about this topic. And um, um, it, 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 it's, um, it's, it's kind of uh, it's kind of how I took out the frustration of all of the craziness that was happening around COVID by just um, buckling down and writing. And so I ended up writing the book faster than I had um, expected and uh, thought I could get it done. And um, yeah, it ended up being longer than the Bitcoin standard, but uh, I think it was uh, if it was good because there's a lot of stuff that I wanted to include in the Bitcoin standard, which I couldn't because, you know, it's a Bitcoin book. And now this really explains what Bitcoin fixes and how Bitcoin fixes this. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to know, how do you do your research? Because you include so much information and, you know, notes from like the Bank of England and all these historical writings. So how do you find that information? Because it's honestly so different from a lot of the things that people learn in very well respected universities yeah that's really the key that's a good question and i think um, honestly i think the uh, the uh, the secret is not in what i read it's in what i don't read and so <laughs> the key is don't watch tv don't watch the news don't read mainstream newspapers and mainstream articles because generally it's a lot of noise and also it's um, you know it's it, it's uh, it has an agenda it has many agendas and you you might think that you can detect the agendas but really if you find yourself um, clicking on it again if you think that you're reading it uh, while you detect the agenda I'm sorry to inform you that no it's uh, it, it's working on you you are the target and um, if if it wasn't working you wouldn't be coming back. So it, it, it forces you to uh, come up with the agenda. And I think, you know, even, even for ignoring the agenda aspect of it, there's just the, um, there's just the fact that uh, things that everybody knows are not very valuable, you know. Um, so what's written in the New York Times is read by many people. They all know it. And so if you're constantly reading it and if you wanted to write something, then you're just regurgitating what's there it's not going to be very interesting and informative for a lot of people because they already um, can see uh, they can see these kind of insights. So I think really my key research uh, uh, trick is to just uh, ignore a lot of the low hanging fruit in terms of information and knowledge. And that, uh, that really is what frees up your brain to think differently. This is, and it's something, you know, I've been doing for quite a while. It's been at least 10 years that I've not been, uh, I don't have a TV, I don't watch uh, news, and I don't read uh, mainstream newspapers. Um, my Twitter is essentially my window onto the world. And um, my idea is that I follow interesting people, and I follow people who offer a lot of um, signal and very little noise. And um, if there's something important happening in the world, I'll find out from these people. And um, if they keep repeating things that are inconsequential, then I unfollow them. Um, well, I unfollow people for all kinds of different reasons. And I hope, you know, people don't take it personally. It's uh, tw the, the key thing is like well, on Twitter, it's um, you need to be promiscuous, basically. Um, it's, it's, it's not Facebook friends where if you unfriend somebody, then, you know, you're not friends with them anymore. Um, it's not about being friends. It's about following somebody's feed. And so it's... Um, it's it, it's not personal and so it's just uh, good to put yourself out there and to get exposed to all kinds of different uh, information and um i mean this is kind of the general um you know the, the 
in in many ways it works like this like you you need to stop doing the bad things in order to get good things um and so if you if you if you find yourself continuously preoccupied with things that are not helping you grow then um it's not so much about trying to find the things that help you grow first you got to stop doing the things that don't help you i think that's a good lesson that applies to many aspects of life and beyond that i think is just um i have this knack for uh, getting online and really surfing the internet uh, very uh, very uh, what's the word i'm looking for um, exploratively and courageously and just going places and following obscure links and continuing to read about um, obscure things so yeah so like the bank of england stuff um, it's one of those things it, it's uh, it's extremely interesting and extremely important information and it's something that very few people talk about. It's something that happened a hundred years ago. And this information was uncovered in 2017 and 2019. Um, literally, just that was the first time that anybody had mentioned this. So what the Bank of England did in terms of um, surreptitiously buying government bonds by having their uh, two of the people who work at the bank buy the bonds in their own name with supposedly their own private money but it was money from the bank and that's how they managed to finance world war one and that's really how the fiat standard was born and um the fact that the uh, central bank the bank of england uh, effectively took oh, took all of the gold that was in circulation in england or the vast majority of people's gold they collected it during the world war I mean, it's an enormously important piece of information, but very few people talk about it because it's just, you know, it's it's not in the official history books and people like to just follow what is in the official story. So there's mountains of stuff written about the war and the financing of the war. Very few people will mention um, what the Bank of England did with the gold and how the Bank of England asked uh, the British people to stop using the gold. And, it, you know, it didn't happen that long ago. It's only a century ago. Um, you know, people who were alive then, some of them only died 30, 40 years ago. And yet it, does, it, it, it isn't mentioned. Um, but um, I, I, I don't even know how I came across it. But uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where I don't really have an idea. It's, it, it's almost like Bitcoin. You asked me, I think, in our previous interview, you know, how do you find out about Bitcoin? I don't know. I just go on the internet and... I really surf it and sail on the seas of the internet and come across all kinds of interesting stuff and take notes. And um, here we are. <laughs> well, I mean, what I love and what I'm sure a lot of people love about your work is it's so rooted in just history and facts. Things that happen, it, you have no opinion one way or another. It was just, this is how it was. These are the documents that you know, indicate what, what happened and what series of events took place. And I, I think I, a lot of people would agree that right now, if you do watch the media, it's there's a narrative or there's people's opinions. It's not necessarily based on fact, but you go back, you find these documents, you find this information. Decisions were made ultimately because of money, like so many decisions made in politics all across the world today. So why why is Bitcoin so like, niche why why is austrian economics so niche when when i read your works your your books it's so obvious to me it's like this is based on fact this is why the gold standard was better this is why we now have some of the problems why is that not obvious to everybody yeah i guess the short answer is that um uh, you know the people who write the books and the people who write the newspapers benefit from the system as it is and so they have no institutional incentive or financial incentive to be um pointing out the problems with it. So um, this was one of the shocking things that I came across in um, doing my PhD in economics. It's just how little critical thinking there is when it comes to the Fed. It's, it's, um, it's an econ department is very similar to a one party state where, you know, there's the government and the dear leader and uh, all official organs of the state are just constantly out there talking about how all of the dear leaders' decisions are great and fantastic. I think, you know, the, the, the wake-up moment for me was in the 2008, 2000, um, 2007, 2008 financial crisis when all kinds of crazy things were happening and almost um, the vast majority of economists, you know, um, they their job consisted of waiting to see what the Federal Reserve would do and then 
coming up with justifications and repeating those justifications and basically dumbing down the arguments that the Federal Reserve presents. And it's it was a wake-up call for me and it was a wake-up call, I think, for a lot of people because, you know, and, and it was similar to what was happening last year in terms of the coronavirus uh, response. So, like, if you, if, if you asked somebody, uh, you know, if you, if you go to some of those people and tell them, hey, you know, I think I have an idea. If, say, in December, you told them, if there's going to be a respiratory illness, if there's going to be a respiratory illness, I think we should lock everybody at home and um, we should force five-year-olds to wear masks um, for indefinitely. I'm 100% certain that at least 90% of people would have called you crazy in December, you know, particularly intelligent, educated um, people. And yet when this comes from authority, these very same people turn around and say, yeah, well, obviously we need to do that because, you know, we have to flatten the curve and we have to prevent the exponential spread. And, you know, it's exponential. You just don't understand exponentials and you, um, and, and, and then it's just, uh, an attempt to rationalize what is happening. And I think that's ultimately, that's fiat. That's the, that's the product of the fact that money is assigned by fiat. And that's kind of the, the, the central argument of the second uh, part of my book, which is called Fiat Life, which looks at how um, the fiat standard affects uh, people's lives and, and you know, the society and politics and economics in general. Um, uh, in, in, in a sound monetary system, the only way that you can make money is if you create value for others. So you make something valuable, others will give you money in exchange. But in the fiat monetary system, if you, um, if you happen to have a connection to the people who are able to uh, issue credit backed by the government, then you're also making money without having to offer anything of value. And so we have this almost cancer uh, of 100 years of institutions that have been growing um, not because they offer value but because they appeal to the uh, money printers effectively and so and well it's not really money printers it's really the credit issuance and you know the central point of the first part of the book is to explain how fiat money is credit money and how it works in terms of credit issuance so it's not so much that you know somebody has a printer and then if you're friends with a guy with a printer then you get stashes of $100 bills um, it's that uh, it's a credit system and if you're friends with the uh, institutions that allocate credits then you do well for yourself. And so I think, um, and so I have a chapter on uh, the effect that this has had on science and academia. And I think this is, this is really why the state of academia is what it is today, in that there's very little critical thinking, there's very little opposition, and it's just uh, uh, deference to authority. And people who get really, you can't really say it's education, it's training, it's um, it's really trained to um, rationalize the positions of power and communicate them to society. So there's there's no serious debate in in whether it's uh, you know in economics or in uh, many of the other uh, fields of science. You know there's no serious debate in nutrition departments about what constitutes a really good diet. Everybody is constantly just repeating what the USDA uh, says. And there's no serious debate on issues of climate. Everybody agrees. You know we're, we're the world's going to end very soon. There's a catastrophe coming and. Um, it's just about, you know, waiting to see what the orders are from above about how we handle that catastrophe. Well, you know, one thing everyone talks about today is just how much wealth inequality there is. And we have the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks with their stock options who are billionaires. And then we have people who, um, you know, have it really hard to try to make it on a day to day basis. So do you think that under the Bitcoin standard, there would be more equality? Or if we had kept the gold standard, if we never got off it, would would wealth be more evenly distributed? Um, I think the, uh, you know, it's it, it, it's difficult for me to be able to predict what society would look would have looked like if we'd had 100 uh, years of that. You know, I, I can't really tell if somebody like Bezos or, or, you know, if today's Bezos and Musk's would be richer than what they are. But I would be able to tell, you know, maybe maybe they would be very rich. But I think there's there's a difference between uh, being rich because you're being productive and valuable to society versus being rich because you're essentially a parasite. And I think 
um, this might piss off a lot of your listeners, but I think, you know, th there's a very instructive lesson in looking at today's, the world's richest man today, which is Elon Musk, I think, and comparing him to the world's richest man under the gold standard, which was David Rockefeller. Now, David Rockefeller was, uh, you know, people think Rockefeller is just this dynasty of very rich people, but David Rockefeller was born to a poor family in Ohio, and he got a job in the oil industry and he managed to work his way up in that industry and completely revolutionized the industry. And I, I did a whole podcast episode about... Um, Love that episode. The fiat yeah, and, leader, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's easy to kind of hate on the Rockefellers because in the 20th century, they may have done a lot of uh, shady stuff, his kids and descendants. Um, and, you know, they... they <laughs> they really uh, took uh, took part in the fiat system and benefited enormously from the fiat system. But if you focus on David Rockefeller himself, how he built himself, he became the richest man in the world by practically making the life of everybody in the world enormously better. I mean, everyone in the world today benefits from the fact that Rockefeller revolutionized the oil industry. And of course, it's very fashionable to hate on the oil industry today, but the reason you and I can talk to each other across oceans, the reason we have computers, the reason we have electricity, the reason um, newborn babies, um, uh, premature babies can survive in incubators is because we have electricity and we have reliable, cheap, high power available um, in many, many places of the world. And it's just completely changed our life. And Rockefeller had a massive, massive role to play with that, to play in that. He, 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 he revolutionized how people cooked, how people worked, how people uh, kept their homes warm and increased everybody's productivity and quality of life and life um, expenditure. So that's what you needed to do in order to be a Rockefeller under the uh, gold standard. And let's look today, you know, what has Elon Musk done? You know, he's, um, he was at PayPal. He was, he did nothing at PayPal. He was uh, part, basically um, he was, um, he had his own little startup and Peter Thiel had a startup. Peter Thiel had a product, but no funding. Musk had funding, but no product. They merged and um, Musk spent five months partying as CEO and then they fired him and he got a lot of stocks, but the company was built without him. And then uh, later on, he just used that money to go from one uh, business to the other where um, it's the same thing. He's just constantly managing to benefit from uh, subsidies and from credit and from access to financing. Because, you know, once you get to a point where you are, um, we have a lot of money, you can get financing in the cheap. And so, you know, today he's the richest man in the world and Tesla produces less than 1% of the world's cars. And Tesla has not revolutionized anything for anybody. Sure, a bunch of rich people are able to drive cars paid for by poor people because they're heavily subsidized uh, by gasoline car drivers. Um, and okay, maybe the driving experience is a little bit nicer, but the range of the Tesla car is far shorter than the range of the gasoline car. And um, the charging time is many, many multiples of what it takes to recharge your gasoline car by refilling it. So um, yeah, sure, it's, it's, it's a nicer toy for a bunch of rich people, but it hasn't changed anything uh, really about the world. And um, yet he manages to lord it over all the rest of us with all of his um, money because of his connections and because of the subsidies and because of, you know, carbon credits. So he gets Chrysler and Ford and um, General Motors to pay him a lot of money. Um, effectively, you know, people who buy $10,000 cars are subsidizing Tesla's. Uh, because uh, of some story about carbon dioxide or whatever. Um, so I think um, I, I can't definitively say whether we would have uh, no rich people like Bezos. I think we might well have very rich people, but I think they'd be very rich by offering a lot of value for people and particularly offering a lot of value for the poor. Like you just can't become the richest person in the world if you're selling um, something for the tiny richest 1% of the world. You have to offer something that's massively valuable to everybody that makes poor people want to pay you money because it's worth it for them. You know, it's worth it for them to pay you for the kerosene and uh, it's worth it for hundreds of millions of people to pay you for it because it makes their life better and more productive. Yeah, so, but it sounds like you believe that maybe under the Bitcoin standard and maybe if we did have the gold standard, 
it would be more equal. Like we wouldn't have this massive, massive divide that gets worse and worse every single year of the, the rich up here and then everyone else down here having it harder and harder. Because even, I mean, one of the things that I think about when I read your book is back in the 70s, you could come to Venice and you could buy a place, you could be a postal worker and have a, an apartment in Venice, California, and your income was enough. And fast forward a couple decades and all of a sudden you might have to have multiple jobs or you know have inherited money or get really, really lucky or get in on Bitcoin early to afford something in the same place. Like, How did that happen in such a short amount of time to where now millennials, like I'm a millennial, my friends, they can't afford the houses that their parents could. Some of them can if they move to tiny, tiny towns, you know, in, in the Midwest. But if you're talking especially bigger cities, nice suburbs, you can't afford what, what your parents could. Why is that? Yeah, I think um, a, a lot of people kind of get focused on, you know, the Rockefellers and the Musks and the Bezos when thinking about the inequality. But really, these people are outliers. It's one out of 8 billion or a few thousand people out of 8 billion people. I think where it really, where, where the difference really shows is in the ability of the poorest people to drag themselves out of poverty. That's what really matters. So, um under a system where money holds its value, everybody can work their way up by simply saving, you know, and you didn't need to um, know how to pick stocks. You didn't need to understand what bonds are. You didn't need to understand how to time the commodities market. You didn't have to follow monetary policy. This is basically what everybody needs to do today in order to just maintain the value of their money, let alone get rich. You know, if you just don't want to get poorer every year, you need to be following the financial press all the time and um, trying to figure out what's going on and have a diversified portfolio between bonds and stocks and um, all kinds of other sort of sophisticated arcane things, which is a full-time job. I mean, if you want to be able to do that, you, you could get lucky. You know, you get in on something very early and then it works out very, very well. But for the vast majority of people, you know, this is a job that requires um, time, attention, focus and um, hard work. And you're up against professionals who do this all the time. You're up against Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and uh, all of these uh, investment managers and hedge funds who are out there with enormous resources to study what is going on and to make decisions and enormous analytical capability, which there's absolutely no way that if you're a postal worker or if you're a, um, you know, just a regular person working on a regular, productive, decent, good job, you can't match that. You can't beat those people. And so you're constantly destined to um, stay behind effectively because it's, 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 it's a race and it's not, it's, you know, your money can't just hold on to its value. So you need to be constantly investing and constantly gambling. And that's why I like to say it in, in the book, you know, with fiat money, you have to earn your fiat money twice. You have to earn it when you earn it, when you work, you know, you break your back to get the buck. And then you have to break your back again, trying to figure out how to put it in the right places at the right time and buy Apple or invest in real estate or um, um, buy commodities so that you are able to maintain the value in that money so that it's, it's, it's not lost. And so, of course, this favors the rich at the expense of the poor. And of course, the other aspect of it is the, um, the ability to borrow. Since everybody is in debt, everybody's on credit, uh, very few people are on, um, very few people hold savings. Um, you know, there, there's a certain threshold that you need in order to get on those financial markets. And um, if you don't have an enormous amount of money, you know, in, ter in terms of fees and the transaction costs that are uh, involved, both the fees that you have to pay, but also the, 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 the kind of the mental transaction costs and the time that you need to spend, it'll leave you behind. There's no way that you'll be able to match all the others. So this is what I, what I think of. And it's why... Um, and and uh, I discuss this, you know, when pe people all, in the, the, the thing that I do in the framing of the fiat standard is, um, you know, people are always talking about the heavy cost of Bitcoin. Well, in the fiat standard, I look at the cost of fiat. How much does it cost for us to have this um, fiat monetary system? It's not like Bitcoin where we can figure out how many machines are running and then how much electricity they're running. It's much, much more pernicious in the way that we um, pay that cost. And the way it's paid is that, uh, the money is constantly devalued, so everybody's money is losing value. And I run the numbers on 
how much uh, money supply increases on the fiat standard. On average, you know, the average fiat currency does 30% increase in supply per year. But that, you know, take that's an average that gives all currencies equal weighting. If we try to weigh the average so that uh, weigh the average by the size of the currency so that you know uh, the, the venezuelan bolivar counts for only one um, percent or 0.1 percent of the us dollar because it is much smaller than the us dollar then the average number is something close to about 14 percent so in the last 60 years fiat money has increased on average overall you know all, all of the world's fiat money has increased around 14 percent per year now think about um uh, the, 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 the kind of um, uh, pro-central banking apologia that we get from um, fiat fans, fiat enthusiasts is, well, nobody holds fiat for savings. You need to invest in bonds and stocks and something or the other. And that's, uh, that's fine, you know, because bonds and stocks go up because government is running all of this inflation that makes our stocks and bonds, you know, that increases investment and therefore makes the stocks more productive. And so everybody can beat inflation and that ends up being better. And that's just very, very, very um, evil and pernicious to be saying that because um, the people who are able to beat inflation are the ones who are able to get in on financial markets with uh, large amounts of money. And the people who don't, you know, are the people who hold cash, the vast majority of cash. Well, the majority of cash is held by rich people because, you know, they're rich, but the majority of um, cash as a percentage of people's portfolio is held by poor people. Yeah. In other words, the poor people, whether it's in the rich countries or the poor, pe poor people all over the world, they are the ones whose net worth is predominantly in cash. They don't own assets. They don't own a lot of real estate. They don't own stocks. They don't own bonds. They Their, their only financial asset is whatever cash they can get their hands on. It's really their lifeboat. And that lifeboat is continuously being devalued at 14% per year in order to finance the financial assets of the rich. And so it's, 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 it's absolutely amazing and very telling that, you know, the same people that are constantly bleating about um, inequality and uh, angry about inequality and talking about taxing the rich, it's no coincidence that most of these people are financed and they and they got their degrees from fiat universities and therefore they don't talk about the problem of inflation and the effect that it has on the poor but it is a very very serious problem and it is the reason why these uh, the vast majority of the world's poor can't escape poverty because their only ladder out of poverty is accumulating savings um, you know, you, you, if you have very little money, you can't put it in stocks and bonds. And um, But if your money was good, if your money wasn't leaking at 14% a year, if your money wasn't becoming devalued and diluted every year at 14%, well then, you know, imagine a money in which, which appreciates at 2%. I mean, just imagine if we ran the last 100 years of human history, last 107 years of human history on the gold standard, every year appreciating at only 2%. Let's just assume 2%. Instead of every year devaluing the currency um, by 10, 20, 30%, as is the case in many cases, 50 and 100 um, when you get hyperinflation. Imagine if we just had 2% appreciation. Think about how different life would be. Think about how many people all over the world, particularly in poor countries, have been financially ruined by inflation. You know, people who had, everybody knows somebody who had that story. In fact, most likely everybody's descended from somebody who experienced that at some point they had their life savings in the bank and then the bank went bust or the the, the money went bust and the currency collapsed and then the family was ruined and it took them decades to recover from it and in many parts of the world you know people don't recover from this the country just keeps sinking further and further and further now if, imagine if you had a hard money that appreciated at two percent per year think about how much cheaper everything would be and think about how much wealthier everyone would be and then think about the implication for inequality so maybe we we'll still have bezos and musk but i think um the real tragedy of fiat i i, I really think we a lot of people like you know when they when they want to think about how the world would be better economically they tell you oh we'd have colonies in the moon and colonies on mars and maybe but i don't really think that's the real jackpot here i think if we'd had a hundred years of money increasing in value at two percent we'd have everybody in the world today having 24-hour electricity 
hot and cold running water at home. I think those things would be just basics that every single house on the planet would have because they're extremely cheap and they continue to get cheaper. There's really no excuse. No matter what you do as a human being, you know, if you work for a few years, you should be able to afford a house with electricity and running hot and cold water. The fact that you don't is because you live in a place that has been uh, and is being um, essentially economically pillaged by inflation. What was the most surprising thing that you learned while writing this book? What's something that you maybe researched and you were like, whoa, this this fits my thesis even more or maybe makes you a little bit more understanding? Because I know one of the things you mentioned in the book is that you sort of saw why fiat emerged and you were a little bit softer to sort of the motives behind it. But what was the biggest surprise? Um, I think, uh, well, yeah, like as I was writing and I started becoming a more understanding of why it would come about, and I try and communicate that in the first part of the book. But I think um, the kind of uh, the, the, the most fascinating part of the book for me, perhaps, like was what really tied it all together um, very brilliantly and beautifully for me was Michael Saylor when he just showed up out of nowhere uh, like a um, knight in shining armor into the bitcoin world and then just started shooting endless mountains of uh, endless bullets of wisdom at everybody one of the most amazing things that he um, said is i think the best treatment of the topic of inflation in terms of uh, its effect on prices was his idea that inflation is a vector. You can't look at inflation as a number. You need to look at it as a vector. And intuitively, I'd had an idea about, you know, I, I had already written a lot of stuff about why the CPI is bogus and why the CPI doesn't work and why uh, it understates inflation because people will naturally substitute away from the more expensive goods into the cheaper goods. And so... Um, yeah, from your delicious always... steak to the industry sludge burger. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, just because the price of the steak goes up doesn't mean that you can afford to buy the steak. You won't, you know, your basket of goods is still going to be determined by the money that you have. And so people have been substituting away from goods, from decent goods into inferior goods. And that's um, reflected in many aspects of it. But I think the way that Sailor expressed it as it's, it's a vector and it's a vector where prices... Um, um, change depending on the specific properties of goods. So for instance, digital goods, goods that involve low marginal costs, um, they their prices continue to drop no matter what happens with inflation. You know, So laptops continue to get cheaper and cheaper. So your laptop today is, you know, if you wanted to compare it in terms of its um, properties, if you wanted to buy a similar laptop five years ago, um, it would have been much more expensive. You may have not needed to buy several laptops in order to have the performance that you get from your laptop today. So your laptop is constantly getting cheaper and cheaper because that's just technology for you because it's... it's, it's um, yeah, deflationary. It, 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 yeah, it's very deflationary. It's, it's, it's high productivity. And with, you know, things that are... Uh, that involve a lot of industrial um, work and not a lot of um, manual labor... It, the, the price rises are not going to be very high. And so that's why industrial food doesn't reflect inflation a lot. And so if your diet consists of industrial waste, then there is no inflation. You know, the industrial waste, they, they just keep making more. The fact that you can keep churning out more. And as uh, money devalues, people always keep demanding more and more of the cheap stuff. But if you want actual nutrition, if you want to live in a house in a good neighborhood, if you want to go to a good hospital, if you want to go to a good university, these things, their prices increase much higher and their prices increase at a rate similar to the rate of increase in the money supply. And that's where you really do see the inflation. And I think it's, it's an absolutely brilliant way of thinking about how fiat works. And it really, for me, I think it tied the whole book together. It's like once I heard that, I... I went from the point where I'm researching and I'm writing and I'm looking at the outline and doing it. And then I'm like, okay, this is it. The book is set. I'm just going to copy these ideas from Michael Saylor and it's going to tie the whole thing together. <laughs> I love it. It's so interesting because I think that the more I look at life in America, it has this very shiny veneer. Everyone's the most educated that anyone's ever been. The life expectancy, I guess, is technically longer. People are living in houses. They have nice cars. They have iPhones that are getting better and better. But under the surface, most people are in debt. 
most people are, everyone's getting divorced. People feel like they can't have kids because it's too expensive to plan for the future and the climate is going to destroy the planet. I mean, it, it's almost like we live in a world of imaginary wealth. And the truth is, it's like rotten inside. Yep. Fiat wealth. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, one of the chapters I just want to focus on are sections of the book because I feel like everyone should read this because it concerns all of us. We all eat. The fiat food was fascinating to me. It came with some of the most surprises because I come from Europe where my family was always eating healthy, but we were also used to sort of an... Um, in a food economy where it's small farms, everything is very fresh, everybody cooks for their families or themselves. And then I moved to America and my friends are eating things from mi microwave dinners, f you know, freezers. Everything is this like weird preserve, preser preservatives ridden diet. And everyone's getting, I mean, it's just a fact, everyone's getting more and more fat. We're having huge issues with our health, with cholesterol and, you know, heart issues diabetes, obviously that's impacting how sick people get with COVID. So can you touch on just giving a preview of what people will learn in your book about food and how government subsidies basically have defined the diet across the world in the US, but also across the world with soy and corn and all of that? Yeah, I think um, the way that I put it in the uh, um, book, my thesis is kind of twofold. On the one hand, we have um, the inflation is causing the prices of food to go up and foods are the most important good that everybody consumes everybody has to eat everybody goes to the grocery store every day and so they pay money for food so inflation on food is the most uh, politically sensitive issue so everyone's always concerned about what's happening with food prices and everyone's always um and, and governments are always concerned about trying to make sure that people aren't too angry about the rise in their food prices so on the one hand, we have this force where governments are trying to do everything they can to make food prices not look too bad. And then on the other hand, you know, the flip side of the coin is, you know, where's that inflation um, coming from? It's coming from the government being able to um, finance whatever it wants. So on the one hand, the government has an incentive to try and stop you from um, noticing that the value or the, the, the price of food is going up. And on the other hand, the government has, because it's destroying your currency, and making your food more expensive, it has a lot of economic power and resources, which it can use in order to essentially shape the realities of markets. And I use, you know, the, the examples of food and um, education and um, energy, because, you know, <laughs> I, I chose those three because I think they're extremely important. The things that I've studied very closely, um, but you could apply the same analysis to many other issues. But in both um, energy and food, we see the same um, dynamic, which is uh, prices rise, government has more money, government intervenes in the market in order to try and hide the effects of its inflation uh, of its inflationary policies. And so with food, this has meant governments basically trying to promote as much as possible, the cheap foods that don't rise a lot in price. And if you and, and this is something that you know i'd been uh, coming across for many years because i got uh, <laughs> awakened on the food issue um, about 10 15 years ago and um you know I, I improved my health massively by simply realizing you know just because something is in a supermarket you doesn't mean you have to eat it and once i became more conscious about that and I started reading more and you know there's there's an enormous amount of literature out there right now that is emerging mostly because of the internet, not because of nutrition science, not because of universities and academia and nutrition professors who are still repeating the same dogma that government wants. But, you know, because of the internet, you know, it's allowing everybody all over the world to experiment and report their experiments. And we're seeing patterns emerge. We see Facebook groups with millions of people from all over the world reporting regularities. You know, I stopped eating this form of highly processed, cheap junk and this health problem went away and that health problem went away so uh, you know th these stories add up and uh, we see the trend in them and we see um we see how much uh, 
you know, you can tie the dot, you can connect the dots, and you can see how much money and effort and subsidies and government policies have gone into promoting those foods. So on the one hand, you have the dietary guidelines telling everybody that you should eat this and eat that and um, basically telling people to eat all of the stuff that is uh, that has low price elasticity, the stuff that involves a lot of industry. And so therefore, when there's inflation, that stuff's price doesn't rise. So corn, soy, sugar, uh, flour, um, and I think perhaps the most pernicious is seed oils, which are absolutely devastating. And they've just been normalized as food because all over the world, doctors and nutritionists are telling you, well, this is low fat and it's better than animal fat. And it's insane because all cultures everywhere in the world, and that's, you know, that's where I bring in some of the literature that I've read on nutrition, which is also kind of very similar to the Austrian school in that it is um, not mainstream, it's not taught in nutrition schools, it's not taught in universities, but it's extremely coherent and extremely powerful. And really, it's been life changing for me. Uh, all over the world, all cultures base all of their diets on animal fats. It's, it's, it's the one dietary constant everywhere, everywhere in the world. Um, everybody has to live on animal fats. There are no cultures that don't eat animal fat. It's never existed. And yet we're told that this is bad. And we're told that the alternative, which is highly processed industrial poison, it's essentially industrial waste, you know, canola oil and all of these things, they're industrial waste that they've managed to make, um, that they managed to make slightly less poisonous so that they don't kill you straight away when you eat it, that kills you slowly and then allows you to generate a lot of profits for the medical industrial complex, which is another huge fiat issue, which I did not get into in the book because, you know, there's only so much you can write in one book. Um, so all of these things, you see them, you know, governments are, first of all, telling people to eat the cheap stuff. They're heavily subsidizing the cheap stuff producers, and they're trying to force people to eat all of this industrial junk. Um, you combine all of those things, and that's how you end up with, I think, this current health catastrophe where the I think it's something like 90% uh, of Americans are metabolically unhealthy, which is insane. I think 88% is the number that I last heard. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. And I think this pandemic really exposed that. Like people are getting sick if they have underlying conditions. And a lot of these underlying conditions, unfortunately, weren't necessarily inherited. People people cause them because they're not active. They're not eating the right foods, you know. And, and what I love about you, Safe, is like you're so – you're skeptical. Like I was raised to be very skeptical and I saw around me and this isn't, you know, to, to offend anybody that I grew up with, but I saw a lot of my friends or their families just, oh, well, my doctor said this, or I saw it on TV or I saw the commercial or the government said so. So it's true. Why would they lie? They would get in trouble if they lied. That would be illegal, whatever. And it's just, it's so blatantly obvious that if you peel back the layers and follow the money and see, you know, how the decisions were made, that these people don't have your best interest at heart. Um, you have to be really, really careful and choose based on, I, I don't know, I guess common sense, which feels like it's lacking a little bit. But that's what I appreciate also about your writings. Um, as far as the Bitcoin standard to, to start to wrap up, do you feel like, you know, with people believing what they hear from authority today more than ever, I would I would argue, do you feel like that's going to be an obstacle in adopting the Bitcoin standard? Like if the government and if people who are uninformed or people who want to maintain the fiat system, they go out and they have messaging that says, hey, this threatens the U.S. dollar. Your savings, your pensions, your, you know, your retirement is in the U.S. dollar. You have to be against Bitcoin. Do you see that as a threat or how do we move to the Bitcoin standard in a world where governments dominate? I see this as karmic justice, really. It's um, it's one of the most amazing things about Bitcoin that the um, more you are benefiting from the current uh, system, the less likely you are to believe that Bitcoin can work, the less likely you are to buy it, and the less likely you are to benefit from it. And, um, you know, I think it's beautiful that somebody like uh, Jamie Dimon is constantly um, shitting on Bitcoin, and I hope he continues with it. And sadly, unfortunately, his bank is now offering it to their clients. It's yeah, it's not ideal, but, you know, we uh, I, I, I wish him 
continued um, dogged determination in fighting Bitcoin. It's beautiful that people who are being destroyed, who, whose economics, who, whose economy and currency is being destroyed in places like Lebanon and Venezuela are having to get to terms, come to terms with Bitcoin. Uh, you know, um, the, the people in Lebanon today are um, a lot less uh, skeptical of Bitcoin than they were three years ago. They've um, been humbled. And I think... Uh, that's a good thing. People who suffer more are. I, I hope. Uh, I hope people who suffer more from fiat manage to benefit from it. But you yeah, know, it doesn't hurt Bitcoin. It hurts. Uh, it hurts fiat people. So that's good. Let's say we move on to the Bitcoin standard. Like fast forward a hundred years from now, is it possible that governments basically buy up Bitcoin and then issue paper notes and start to inflate the the supply beyond the amount of Bitcoins that they have, like they did with gold? Or why wouldn't that? Why couldn't that happen? That's kind of the um, um, one of the central questions of the fiat standard, and the idea is um, well. When explaining why fiat came about, it's because of its superior saleability across space. So, in the Bitcoin standard, I explain how um, you know gold had the best saleability across time. In the fiat standard, fiat came along because it had the superior saleability across space. And um, the fact is that you just can't move gold around. And so, when the Bank of England goes and confiscates everybody's gold, you know, if you want, didn't want to give up your gold. Well, you were just stuck with a shiny yellow rock in your drawer. Um, you couldn't use it to trade with the rest of the world. You, you couldn't put it in the bank because the bank wouldn't give it back to you and you'd had no other alternative. Now, I, 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 I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what the world would look like in 100 years, but I think the reason we could be optimistic that Bitcoin would fare better is that it's far cheaper to take your Bitcoins out of your local central bank and still manage to use them internationally and still manage to benefit from uh, using them. So it's um, um, it, it, it has enough, well, enough is, an, is, is, is we're going to find out, I guess, but it has much more saleability across space so that um, if governments try to confiscate it, um, it's relatively far easier for people to go around government restrictions and still manage to have functional money. That's the thing. So yeah, your gold holds on to its value in the long term because governments can't inflate it. Bitcoin does that, but on top of that, you can also still use your Bitcoin uh, sending it around the world. We still have half a million transactions a day that are being done on chain and possibly we could do a, a lot more. So you could have half a million people sending their money out of say, um, Brazil, if Brazil imposes capital controls, which if they did with gold, you couldn't do. You know, you couldn't. You, it's very expensive and very difficult and very risky to try and move your golds outside of um, Brazil once Brazil starts confiscating gold. With Bitcoin, it's far easier, far cheaper, and um, far less detectable by governments. Well, so you mentioned you don't have a crystal ball. I know we all wish we did. Um, but what's your biggest question that you're left with after the fiat standard maybe something that you want to explore or just something where you're just you know you you ponder it but none of us have an answer to what's your biggest question maybe about bitcoin um i think you know when i started writing the book one of the main conclusions that i was arriving at was the idea that i don't think um we're gonna have hyperinflation in fiat and i don't think bitcoin will cause hyperinflation and i explain in detail why i think that's unlikely but i started writing the book and started thinking about these ideas in 2018 and 19 and then 2020 came along and that really made me kind of reconsider so then there is the you know the book leads explaining how fiat works in terms of credit and how it functions leads to this conclusion that for a variety of reasons which i don't really have time to get into now uh, it's unlikely that fiat's going to have hyperinflation um and that bitcoin is uh, doesn't need fiat to hyperinflate we, you know fiat can just continue to um shrink into irrelevancy as bitcoin grows and becomes bigger that was kind of the conclusion that i was uh, driving at but i think after 2020 um the fact that governments have just gone so much more inflationary with their policies is one aspect of it. But I think the um, more uh, profound um, shift 
happening is that we see governments moving toward this model of central bank digital currencies, which I think if it does come along, it kind of does invalidate, um, it, it changes the dynamic because the fiat system, as I describe it, as a credit-based monetary system, does have this kind of corrective mechanism where no matter how much credit you create, the credit creation itself leads to um, collapses in the money supply. It leads to a crash in uh, the monetary um, supply because credit, uh, you know, if you read the Austrian business uh, cycle theory, it generates a bubble and then the bubble collapses. And so when you're constantly having these bubbles collapse, it kind of limits the ability of the money supply to expand uh, in an unlimited way. But if we do central bank digital currencies, if you know, essentially what seems to be happening is that central banks are just going to disintermediate the banking system. You know, it's not going to be Bitcoin that kills the banks. It's going to be central banks that kill the banks. And they're just going to give everybody an app where you get your uh, money from the government straight away. Well, if that's the case, you take away the the um, you know the, the the breaks of the credit collapse and you take away the dynamics of the credit market and then you're back to essentially the uh, Goss bank model which is this is Soviet central bank and um, effectively you know it's not literal physical printing of money but you're back to um, dysfunctional Venezuelan Lebanese style central bank uh, handing out money to people it's done digitally in a much more sophisticated way but you're just giving people money in their accounts. And I think if we move toward that, and it seems likely that we are, you know, you, you look at the way that politics is going, particularly in the US and Canada. Um, I mean, it, th this is just completely unthinkable. I think 10 years ago it would have been absolutely unthinkable. This is, if you mentioned it to an economist back then, they would have told you, no, you're crazy. This is what they do in the Soviet Union. We need to have banks and banks are an essential part of the capitalist system. But of course, you know, these same economists now are, um, you know, again, just rationalizing what power tells them to say. So it's becoming more and more widely accepted. And I think uh, if we do see this, then um, it could get a lot ugly and we might actually end up with hyperinflation. So the book leaves, the, the book ends, you know, Sorry to spoil the ending, but the book ends kind of not really um, taking a strong stance on this because, as I said, I don't have a crystal ball, but it makes the case for both scenarios, why we, should, we wouldn't expect to see hyperinflation and then why we would. And, you know, time will tell. Yeah. Well, um, any book you're reading, like what what's on your shelf right now that you're fascinated by? You probably have access to all of these, this great historical stuff. So what are you reading, Safe? I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say that, you know, um, one of the drawbacks of writing books is that um, <laughs> you don't get to read much. So I have not been doing a lot of reading, particularly because, you know, I'm writing my other book, Principles of Economics, which is also winding down. I'm almost done with that. So I've just been spending all my time writing right now. In fact, I, it's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to after finishing writing this second book is finally getting back to reading. So, um, I mean, obviously I've done a lot of reading over the last couple of years um, in terms of what uh, goes into those books. But um, recently, uh, it's been a lot of... Um, it's been a lot of um, just writing rather than reading. But yeah, I, I hope to fix that very soon. Well, Bitcoin Standard is my favorite book. What's your favorite book? It's a tough question. I, I don't know. Um, I guess Bitcoin Standard as well. <laughs> it's, I love it. uh, it's changed my life. Uh, so like objectively speaking, yeah, no book has done more for me than the Bitcoin Standard. Um, I mean, it's it, it's really tough to say to say which one. I Perhaps I could... Um, kind of a, uh, an, 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 um, an underrated choice, I'd say, um, a book called Gold Wars, which is an extremely underrated book. Very few people read that book. Um, I quote it in the Bitcoin Standard and in the Fiat Standard. It's by a guy called Ferdinand Lips, and it's absolutely fascinating. In fact, like there's the Bitcoin Standard, and now there's the Fiat Standard. If I wanted to write another book called The Gold Standard, um, I wouldn't write it because Gold Wars is basically that book. In fact, that book was, to a very large extent, a huge inspiration behind writing the Bitcoin standard and the fiat standard. 
Well, Safe, I want to say thank you so much because the Bitcoin standard changed my life. It really did. It made it set me on this path where now I'm interviewing you again. I have this honor and it gave me a passion about economics, which I never thought I would, and a history of money passion. So the whole space loves you, appreciates you. How can people get the fiat standard? Um, it's on my website, safeadeen.com. You can order it. It'll be up on Amazon in a few days. Maybe by the time this is out, it'll be out uh, on Amazon. So you can pre-order it from Amazon. Um, it's going to be uh, the digital book and the audio book will be out in mid-November. But the physical book might take a few more weeks because of all of the supply chain issues around the world. Um, but if you pre-order from my website, you'll be the first to get it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Always a lot of fun interviewing, um, doing interviews with you, Natalie. I really appreciate how much work you put into your interviews. Thanks a lot.